Hi, my name is Kristen Bramer Moore, and I'm a partner at Tonkin Torp LLP and the chair of our Labor and Employment Practice Group. In this unprecedented time of pandemic, and as our community prepares to reopen and get back to work, we want you to know that we are here for you. Our labor and employment attorneys are staying updated on legal developments and are ready to provide you with counsel as needed by offering advice, giving online presentations, and by sharing written materials and other resources to help you and your business. Do not hesitate to reach out if our legal experts can assist you or your company in any way. Click the link below to be connected to a Tonkin Torp attorney. Take care. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Carey, and I'm joined today uh, with my partner, Haley Morrison. Both Haley and I are members of the Labor and Employment Group at Tonkin Torp. I want to start by welcoming you to or back to our Coffee Break webinar series, where we've been talking through employment issues our clients are facing during the pandemic. And our intent, of course, is to give you some practical advice. Uh, on best practices during the pandemic so that your business will continue to thrive. Our specific topic today is ADA issues in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, there's not a lot that has changed specifically on the ADA, but we're gonna tie it to issues that are coming up during this time. This is the third talk in our series. And for those of you who were not able to be uh, listening in in the last week or the, or the week before, it's not too late. Each of our presentations are recorded and you can um, find them by logging on to our website at tonkin.com. You click the news and events button, and then once there, events button again, and you can find a link that'll get you to the, uh, to the recordings in the Coffee Break series. Next week, you'll be hearing from Megan Ruther and Clay Kreps, and they'll be discussing the future for telecommuting and the new normal and best practice and policies in this new environment. Uh, so let me pause now and make a note about, uh, about our format. <clears throat> As I just mentioned, we're recording the webinar and you need not sign a, a disclosure. No private information is gonna be shared. Uh, please know, however, that should you per, uh, uh, participate in our Q&A uh, section, your question may be recorded in association with your name. <clears throat> So we've designed this webinar to include uh, many uh, questions our clients uh, have asked during the past two months. So hopefully we've anticipated questions that you have and we'll cover those during our presentation. If not, feel free to submit questions in the Q&A section of your Zoom app. And then after our presentation, we'll conclude with some question and answers and try to get as many of those as we can. Um, now, because the situation is rapidly changing, um, we may not always know the answer to the question, uh, or it could be nuanced or too specific for us to address in this webinar format. Uh, and if that's the case, you're certainly welcome to reach out to one of us or to the Tonkin Torp attorney you usually work with. <clears throat> also, uh, as always, we welcome your feedback and any feedback you have after the uh, webinar, including topics that you'd like to hear. Uh, please tell us. We hope to be a source of information for our business community throughout this challenging time and plan to hold additional seminars uh, going forward. So finally, the information that we're presenting uh, today that Haley and I are talking about is as of today, May 21st, uh, 2020, and is not intended to be legal advice. So with those uh, introductions, I'm now gonna turn it over to Haley to start with some of the, of the basics. Thanks, Haley. Good morning, everybody. So those of you that attended Kristen and Chris's presentation last week, this slide may look a little bit familiar. Um, they covered most of these issues in some detail, uh, leaving for Bob and me the ADA, which you'll see on the bottom left hand side. So let's go through just a little bit of review of what they covered uh, quickly from last week as we start our conversation today. Next slide, please. Okay, so the FFCRA is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. That was the legislation that was pushed through as a result of what we're seeing now with this global pandemic. We're gonna talk about the FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, OFLA, and Oregon Sick Leave. Next slide. Okay, so if you recall from last week or from what you've already learned in your own time and research, the FFCRA has two new types of paid leave that are specific to the pandemic. 
The first is an emergency paid sick leave, which is up to two weeks of paid sick leave for isolation, illness, or care of others, or child care responsibilities related to COVID-19. So this is sick leave related to the pandemic. There's also expanded family medical leave, which sometimes now gets con uh, confused with our more traditional FMLA. But this expanded family medical leave under the FFCRA is really particular just to school closures as a result of COVID-19. So school and daycare closures, up to 12 weeks of leave, and these sunset at the end of the year. And next we'll talk about the federal FMLA protections. That's the Family and Medical Leave Act. That's up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. This is our traditional family leave uh, uh, provisions. For an employee to qualify for the FMLA, the employer needs to be big enough as just an initial matter, but also the employee has to have worked for the employer for at least 12 months and have at least 1,250 hours of service and FMLA leave protections are really related to serious health conditions, either for yourself or for your family. There's also some other provisions for birth or adoptions and some military related reasons. Again, we're not gonna get into this, but it's giving you just a little bit of background on our talk today. Uh, next, we have the Oregon protections. The Oregon protections, we have OFLA, which is very similar to the Federal Family Medical Leave Act, and oftentimes they will run concurrently. To qualify for OFLA, the employee has to have been employed for 180 days and worked an average of 24, 25 hours a week during those 180 days. The reasons for the leave are very similar to the FMLA. So again, we're talking about serious medical conditions primarily. Bully has stated during uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, their temporary rule, which that employees may use OFLA to care for children during official school closures. So that would be in addition to or instead of the FFCRA protections. Under the Oregon Paid Sick Leave Act, again, uh, paid sick leave for any short-term health needs for yourself or for your loved ones. Uh, it's much more limited than the FMLA or OFLA, but it is paid leave. Right now during the pandemic, Bully has also said that will apply to school and child care closures and employees that are scared to go to work as a result of COVID-related reasons. So employees can exhaust the paid sick leave because they're fearful of coming to work. Okay, one thing to keep in mind here, um, employees that do not qualify for FFCRA, FEMLA, OFLA, or sick leave, or they've already exhausted all of those leave entitlements, may still have protections under the ADA. And that's something we really wanna emphasize. We see this a lot, it's a very common mistake. For example, an employer may believe that an employee requiring leave for, let's say a mental illness, uh, is not protected because he has not been at the company long enough to qualify for, let's say, FMLA, or the company's not big enough and there's no FMLA or OFLA protections. That employee may still qualify for leave or other accommodations under the ADA. So there is this additional step when we're talking about the employee's own health needs. So I'm gonna turn that back over to Bob to introduce some of these basic ADA concepts. Thank you. Let's go back one slide, please. The, uh, the ADA was enacted to give individuals with disabilities the same rights and opportunities to work as their non-disabled peers. Um, and of course, it prohibits discrimination against persons uh, with disabilities and opens those doors or levels the playing field for all. Uh, in a nutshell, the, the rule for employers is that employers are obligated to provide a reasonable accommodation to qualified individuals with a disability, unless doing so um, is or would be an undue hardship on the business. So let's break down some of those, those terms. <clears throat> the, um, to be qualified, that means that the employee can perform the essential functions of the job with or without an accommodation. Uh, this means that as an employer, you can always require the employee to perform the most fundamental aspects of the job. Uh, for example, if the job requires an employee um, to have physical mobility, such as a job that's out in the field requiring manual labor, um, uh, run in a machine in a warehouse, or, or what have you, you do not need to accommodate an employee's physical need for it to be entirely sedentary or seated. For example, uh, a job running a fork truck in a warehouse can't be done uh, by teleworking. So 
Uh, an employee also is only qualified if he or she is performing the job adequately. And in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, if the employee simply has not demonstrated the, the skills necessary to perform the job, you don't have to uh, adjust or adapt the job um, requirements to match his or her lower skill level. They just would not be a quote qualified um, employee. So next, let's look at the term disability. <clears throat> disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially, substantially limits one or more major life activity. Um, in the old days, when it was just the ADA and before the ADAA, we fought a lot about sort of what that all meant. Uh, and with the, with the advent of the ADAA, the Amendments Act, uh, it sort of opened the door to uh, uh, recognize far more disabilities uh, than, than we had before. Um, disabilities include both physical and mental impairments and major life activities, as you'll remember, are things such as working, eating, sleeping, getting dressed, those kinds of things. <clears throat> disabilities uh, won't qualify under the act uh, that are short in duration. So, um, you know, a headache, uh, transitory issues such as having a cold, sprained ankle, or just another bad day uh, won't qualify as a disability. It truly has to be something that, that um, impairs a uh, major life activity. So let's look next to the undue hardship. And, and this one's a little bit tricky and you have, to be, you have to be really careful as an employer when you go through this element. Uh, un, an employer need not accommodate a disability where it would pose this undue hardship, which means the uh, accommodation would cause significant difficulty or expense to the employer. Uh, a super high threshold, particularly when it comes to expense. The, the courts aren't particularly uh, concerned about the cost of putting in a ramp or other kinds of uh, uh, accommodations that are, are necessary uh, for employees. <clears throat> so uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about uh, examples of, of both. Um, <clears throat> reasonable accommodations can uh, include adjustments to uh, facilities to make them accessible. For example, if you have an employee who uh, is uses a wheelchair, then ramps would be necessary. Uh, modified work schedules, for example, um, modifying the equipment that the employees use, um, or providing just as, as simple as extra time for them to either take a break or to uh, uh, perform a task. All of those are things that can allow someone to perform the essential functions of the job. Uh, and, and that's the whole point. If, if you can do something that will allow them to perform those job duties, uh, then that, that's the trick. Um, now, the, the accommodation has to be reasonable, again, both in expense and other kinds of things. You can't, you can't require an accommodation that's going to effectively shut the doors on the business. Uh, and also, uh, as you'll see on the slide, uh, reasonable does not mean it's the employee's choice. There are lots of examples, and we'll go to the next slide, uh, to talk about the kinds of things employers may do. Um, but again, it has to be a reasonable combination, maybe not the, the best uh, bee's knees uh, decision for the employee. An example would be uh, an employee that has a spinal issue or something uh, like that that requires a standing desk in a workplace. or for example, if that employee uh, operated the fork truck I've been talking about and had to turn and twist to, to see where, where they were driving when they're going backwards, an accommodation there might be uh, additional mirrors. It could be um, a reverse camera that has a screen that the employee could look at. Now that might cost a lot more money and be a lot cooler and, and might be the employee's top choice, but if the mirrors will do it, then, then that's sufficient uh, accommodation. An employee suffering from cancer may need time off for work uh, to, to get radiation, chemotherapy, the like. And it could be both, uh, you know, a block of time to, to get that medical care, and it might be intermittent, intermittent to take um, time out, you know, once or twice a week to go get, uh, get the treatment. Um, employees who have uh, PTSD or uh, mental or other uh, issues where uh, and, it, and it could be, it doesn't just have to be mental health. It could be diabetes or any other number of, of uh, issues that qualify as disabilities. Might just need a short break to take care of their uh, 
uh, take care of themselves, to take a rest, or to check their insulin or the like. All of those uh, are examples of, of reasonable accommodations that will work. Now I'm going to turn it over to Haley to get some additional detail. Uh, thanks, Bob. So Bob just covered some circumstances where you have an employee that you know needs an accommodation. But how do we get to this conversation in the first place? If an employee has a potential disability with an accommodation need, the law requires that employers and employees engage in what is called the interactive process. And the interactive process means really just what it sounds like it, it means. Uh, it is interactive. It's a flexible and informal discussion intended to allow those two parties, the employer and the employee, perhaps with the help, help of a healthcare provider, figure out how best to accommodate the employee's needs so that they can perform the essential functions of the job. Ideally, if this conversation uh, acts as intended, both parties will agree as to what will work best for the employee to allow them to continue to work. So failure to participate in the interactive process is by itself its own legal accommodation or uh, legal cause of action. So this is important to keep in mind. Uh, we do see people skipping over this step when they are pretty sure that the employee cannot be accommodated, uh, but you still need to have the conversation. So even if you're reasonably certain the employee can't come back to work or can't do the job, for whatever reason, whatever their particular disability is, please still have that conversation and together come to that conclusion um, so that you can ward off any liability or any claims for failure to even just participate in this interactive discussion. Uh, important to understand that these conversations are ongoing and they're not just static. So you don't have it one time and call it a day unless that's all the conversation really needed or the situation called for. Generally, though, it's going to continue to evolve over time as the employee's needs change, as leave ends, as the accommodations uh, scale back or maybe ramp up, um, or even business needs change. And the employer now needs to talk about different types of accommodation that might better suit the work environment. Um, as an employer, you are entitled to ask for documentation in support of an accommodation need. Usually that comes from the employee's doctor or other healthcare provider. Um, but do this only when the disability is not obvious. So for example, if the employee is deaf, you do not need a healthcare provider to tell you that. You might need a doctor's help for you to understand what accommodations might be reasonable or necessary or helpful for the employee to do their job, but please don't make that employee go to the doctor just for confirmation that they are indeed deaf. Um, now, for non-obvious disabilities, which is a lot of what we see and probably the vast majority, you may and you should rely on what a doctor indicates unless that doctor's note is plainly suspect. For example, it has somebody else's name on the top or it recites these disabilities that are not part of the conversation. Other than that, it provides you some insurance actually to listen to the healthcare provider's advice and try to start the accommodation conversation based on what the healthcare provider says and with the help of the employee. You may also ask for clarification as to accommodation needs if it's not clear from the doctor's note what would be helpful to this employee. Now, it's sort of as a side note on that particular topic, uh, hopefully your business has an ADA packet that you can send with the employee to the doctor. The best forms will append the job description so that the doctor can actually see the, the job requirements that the employee is expected to perform. Um, and it will have questions to help the doctor go through and identify what the accommodation needs with some particularity. If you do not have an ADA packet like that, please uh, contact Bob or me or your normal Tonkin lawyer and we can put one together for you. Okay, the this says medical tests on that slide, but we're gonna cover that a little bit more as we go forward. So um, here's a word of caution for you and this becomes a little bit of a landmine. Um, but there is also a separate cause of action for perceiving somebody as disabled, whether or not they actually are disabled. So an example of this, which you can see here on this slide, um, is a situation that one of my clients actually faced. This employee was a longtime employee working in a manual labor type of job. Over the years, he gained quite a bit of weight um, and ended up morbidly obese. The employer presumed uh, that there was a probably a high blood pressure or a heart condition issue there without actually knowing 
and started to scale back on some of the requirements that this employee was being asked to do, particularly the more physical aspects of the job. This employee had not asked for an accommodation, had not provided a doctor's note, had not approached this conversation at all, and in fact, was not looking for an accommodation and felt that he was in good health. Um, so as the employer started taking away jobs like climbing up on ladders or doing some of the more physical aspects, it changed the terms and conditions of this employee's job in a way that materially affected him. And he actually ended up suing um, for a perceived as disabled um, cause of action. So we have to be careful there. Um, on the other side of the coin, you may have an employee that has not come to you asking for an accommodation or explaining a disability, but it's very obvious to, to you or to somebody at the company that they do have an accommodation need. At that point, we are on notice that that interactive process needs to start. Um, an example of this from our recent COVID times is a client that called me um, a week or so ago because they had a employee have a mental health um, emergency mental health issue on a Zoom call with a number of other people from the company. It was very clear and obvious to everybody that something was going on. At that point, they were on notice that there was an issue. And so they can't just ignore it. Now they have to get into that interactive process. So how do you do that when an employee hasn't come, with, come to you? Start with the objective non-disability related facts that are informing your concern. And we will talk a little bit more about this uh, later. But for example, you could say, I've noticed you're falling behind on your work. Is everything okay? Is there anything you need? Or in this instance, calling the employee and saying, are you okay? It seemed like something happened on that call. Um, but you need to engage in the interactive process and start that process. Now, if the employee tells you they're fine um, and that you need to leave them alone and they don't need anything, you actually do need to kind of back off. Um, Document that conversation that it happened and that the employee did not ask for an accommodation or recite any need, but you do need to let the employee take the lead on some of this stuff. Okay, now we will finally move into the topic of the ADA and its relation to COVID. Bob, why don't you take over? Thank you, Haley. So, so let me just start with talking a little bit about what is not an ADA issue um, and, and for example, we're all struggling with school closures. Um, you know, the, if parents spend a long time at home with their kids, they may develop uh, a mental health disability, but the school closure itself uh, is, is not an ADA uh, issue. But it is still uh, an opportunity for the employee to have some, some benefits, and that would be the sick leave under the Oregon sick leave or the FF. Uh, CRA leave that Haley talked about before. Caretaking obligations uh, also are not uh, typically analyzed under the ADA because you're, it's not your own problem, it is somebody else's. So for those kinds of uh, circumstances, as Haley discovered or discussed early in the, in the program, sick leave, the FFCRA or OFLA and FEMLA would be uh, the mechanisms by which those employees could take leave. The government stay at home orders, uh, and teleworking are the same. Th those are not ADA issues uh, in and of themselves. Uh, the stay at, at home orders, there are protections in the FFCRA for, for people who are impacted because of that. Um, and the same with the teleworking. If you, if you can't do it because you um, can't work from home, you may get FFCRA uh, coverage. Um, uh, and, and it's possible in some circumstances that we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, that, that there could be an ADA accommodation there, but uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, social distancing, the six foot requirements, those kinds of things, uh, also not uh, ADA uh, uh, topics, but, but certainly part of our uh, new world and dealing uh, with these issues. So what about COVID itself? Is that gonna be an ADA uh, disability? And, and the answer is maybe it will be. If uh, an employee experiences some mild symptoms or is asymptomatic, then it's not gonna be qualified as a disability and will probably be considered in that temporary non-chronic impairment like we talked about before, same as a cold or, or the like, even though it could develop into something uh, worse. So those would not be covered by the ADA. If the employer, I'm sorry, if the employee uh, contrasts COVID though, and starts to suffer some of the more severe reactions that we've seen 
uh, and heard about. Um, and those complications uh, either on their own uh, or exacerbate another health condition or disability the employee has, then that certainly could qualify for ADA coverage, uh, whether it's the COVID itself or perhaps it uh, developed into pneumonia or a cardiac event or, or, or the like, all of those would uh, potentially have ADA coverage. But you know, no one size fits all in any of this, uh, uh, whether it's COVID related or any disability uh, analysis. So the employee still needs to team up with his or her medical provider and help work with the HR professionals to guide the company to appropriate resolution. Uh, Haley, could you talk to us about some particular COVID-19 uh, impacts? Yeah, uh, sure. So let's start by talking about health questions that you can ask and whether or not you can actually do medical exams, whether related to COVID or otherwise. So when I say disability related inquiry, what that actually means is an inquiry that is likely to elicit information about a disability. For example, if you ask an employee if he or she has a compromised immune system, that's a disability related inquiry because it can be easily associated with conditions like cancer or HIV or leukemia. And you're basically asking the employee to tell you about those things. Uh, by contrast, asking an employee about the symptoms of a cold or a seasonal flu, those are not disability-related inquiries because they're not likely to elicit disability-related information. You're talking about symptoms of a transitory um, cold. A medical exam in this context is just what it sounds like for the most part. It's a procedure or test that seeks information about an employee's uh, physical or mental impairments or health. Pretty basic stuff. So generally speaking, when can an employer make a disability-related inquiry or require a medical exam under the ADA? Um, as you will see from the slide, before there is a conditional job offer, so during the application process, on the application, during the initial interview, such questions and exams are prohibited. It's a clear-cut rule, can't do it, don't ask the questions, don't submit them to any tests. Now, after a conditional job offer, you can both make disability related inquiries and require or require employees to do medical health exams, either or both, as long as it applies to all employees or all employees in the job category. So don't single out your older people or your females or your males or whatever. Uh, it needs to apply to everybody in the job category. So when would you do this and, and when would it be a good idea? An example might be an employer that requires newly entering employees working in a safety sensitive position like driving the forklifts that Bob mentioned earlier uh, to have a post offer physical exam. We see this with pilots or first responders. That's okay if all employees in those positions are asked to undergo the same test or ask the same questions. Now in most of our work environments, there are lots and lots of good reasons why we do not want to ask those questions or ask for medical exams at all. That's a whole nother topic that we could cover for another day, but if you are doing some of that, you know, think about engaging your counsel or having some discussions about whether or not that's actually needed or a good idea. In some instances, it very much is, and some it's really not. Now, uh, with COVID, that means that you could test all new employees entering into your workforce to make sure that they're virus free. I understand the practical limitations of that with uh, the availability of testing right now, but that is what you could do. So post job offer, you could make sure that people are virus free coming into your new environment. Okay, here's a related issue. Can an employer rescind a job offer based on questions that reveal that the employee is at an increased risk of contracting COVID? Meaning the employee does not have COVID, but is more likely to get it. Can you do that? The answer here is actually no unless the applicant would pose a quote unquote direct threat to others. A direct threat is defined as a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of the individual or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced by a reasonable accommodation. So you're seeing the thread here, the same thing, this reasonable accommodation. So what might that mean in this circumstance? Here that might mean an employee whose job involves direct contact with vulnerable populations and who has other risk factors. So for example, 
an employee whose wife is an ICU doctor on the COVID wing, um, and he is a caretaker at a senior living facility. That combination of factors may be sufficient to constitute a direct threat such that you could rescind the job offer having found that out. I, I don't have any court cases to tell you that is okay, but that's an example I thought of that you know may get you there. But be careful if you're making those kinds of judgment calls. Okay, so during an employment, this employee's come on board, they've started working with you, they've been there for at least a little while. What can you ask now? The ADA now goes back to being much more careful and prohibits disability-related inquiries or medical exams unless it is job-related and consistent with business necessity. Now, generally, this is a pretty high threshold, and it severely limits what an employer can ask or require of its current employees related to their disabilities um, or requiring them to get medical exams. So we've gone back to a much narrower circumstance. But with COVID, the, e the EEOC has clarified for us that this pandemic is considered that direct threat that I talked about a little bit earlier, meaning that in this particular slice of time that we're in right now and as it relates to the virus, employers can ask and do more than they otherwise would be able to in a normal circumstance. So employers now can ask employees if they're experiencing COVID symptoms, such as a fever or chills or a cough or sore throat. They can take employees' body temperatures. You could do it every day if you wanted to, but if you're going to do this, please be careful to do it for everyone and on a consistent basis. So for example, when employees get to work in the morning, every one of them on the way in. Um, do it consistently, don't pick and choose. Uh, you can require PPE as necessary or masks. You can delay the start date of an applicant that has COVID symptoms, even if they don't have a positive test. You can withdraw a job offer due to COVID symptoms or a positive test, or you can re require employees to go get a COVID test. Again, practical limitations on availability, but you could do that now pursuant to the EEOC's guidelines. What can you not do? You still cannot ask an employee who does not have COVID symptoms to disclose whether they have a medical condition that makes them more vulnerable. We hear about this a lot. I have this employee that has asthma. I have this employee that's older, um, some sort of vulnerability, and we have companies that want to ask those questions. We understand the desire to ask those questions. You can't do it. Can't do it. Um, can't ask employees about their general wellness using disability-related inquiries that we talked about before. It has to be pretty narrowly construed to this direct threat of the COVID-19 virus. Now, this is looking a little bit into the future, but right now the EEOC's position is that you cannot require employees to get a COVID vaccine or even a flu shot uh, when, that, when those COVID vaccines become available. You can certainly suggest it and recommend it, but as of today, we cannot require that of employees in our work environments. So Bob, uh, back to you, what kind of ADA accommodation complications are we seeing or do we anticipate seeing as a result of this pandemic? Thanks Haley. One of the things that is uh, always somewhat elusive and difficult in an ADA analysis are mental health issues. And uh, you know, we've, we've faced those pre-COVID uh, we anticipate, however, that the post-COVID and, and during COVID uh, pandemic, that we'll see a spike in mental health needs of employees uh, across the board. Uh, and we've seen some of this already, of course, people having trouble with anxiety, depression, and the like. An example uh, you might see or face uh, would be an employee who's usually kind of one of your ha uh, hard-charging, very productive, proactive teammates. Uh, team members, but but during the COVID uh, period has been tough to reach or to motivate, um, and it could be impacted because of stay-at-home orders or or what have you. Uh, in in uh, some circumstances, when performance drops like that, you're going to want to discipline the employee. But before doing that, now particularly now during the the pandemic, ask some questions first. And for example, and it's similar to what what Haley's covered previously. You could approach the employee and say, we've noticed that you're not as productive as normal or not as engaged as normal. Are you doing okay? What can we do to support you? And it may be that he or she is having a mental health issue and, and during the interactive process that Haley talked about, you would learn that there are things that you could do to accommodate that person. For example, giving them 
uh, time to uh, uh, away from home, breaks during the day or, or the like. But remember, don't ask, are you depressed? Are you suffering from some sort of mental condition? Stay away from the labels uh, and, and the uh, cause and simply ask, how can you help? Um, and, and ask about job performance and those facts. So one of the things that uh, can be and, and uh, often is a uh, wonderful accommodation for ADA issues is, is simple leave. Um, and you can have employees that uh, would not otherwise qualify or already have exhausted their FEMLA leave, their OFLA leave, paid sick leave, FFCRA uh, leave, all of the things that have been uh, sort of teed up during the pandemic could already be exhausted, but the employee may still be struggling and need some help before they're able to, to return to work and do their job. And in situations like that, a leave of absence might be the perfect answer. Um, so something you should consider uh, as a reasonable accommodation during this period. Again, the, the safest approach is to team up with the employee and his or her health care provider and engage in the interactive process that, that Haley talked about. Uh, but, but don't forget, leaves can be the best solution uh, for many of your employees, particularly during this time and particularly when they're dealing with mental health issues. <clears throat> Working from home is, a, is another uh, super interesting thing because of COVID. And, and, and we all sort of remember the, the good old days, pre-COVID pandemic, uh, and we had an ADA situation come up and, and uh, employees would say, well, gosh, if I could work from home and not have to commute in or, or have my supervisor see, see when I take a nap or whatever, I'm joking a little bit. Um, but, but those kinds of things, and, and you know the HR response and the management response was no way can you work from home. Uh, we've got to have you here. It's an essential function of the job and we need to have eyeballs on you at, at all times. Well, the, the current pandemic in the last couple of months has sort of proven that to be a fallacy. Um, and, and we have now shown that, that many of us, uh, uh, although we may not prefer it, um, uh, working from home is a real possibility for many employees, and it might be a, a viable accommodation uh, for employees who are still uh, suffering in some form of undue hardship. So uh, if you're considering declining a work from home uh, request now or kind of in the, in the aftermath of the uh, lifting of the stay at home orders, you'll need to have a really good reason on why uh, working from home um, uh, isn't going to be an appropriate accommodation and, and certainly even more so than, than in the past where that might not have got the same scrutiny. So an example of, of those kinds of situations would be a, a manager who typically works on site uh, with her team in order to sort of boss the workload and, and, and make sure that uh, the tasks get done. Uh, or she runs actual machinery and needs to be there to push the buttons to get it to start, to sort it out, those kinds of things. Um, obviously, that is a, a situation where the, the person um, uh, has to be there and, and can't work from home and, and telework. So in those situations, if the person is struggling with mental health or other issues, then um, a leave option uh, is uh, most likely uh, a better option and maybe the only option other than uh, or rather than working from home. <clears throat> so one of the things Haley and I and others in the group have have seen and talked about is is a request uh, or or an anticipated spike in requests for working from home as accommodations. Um, and you know I think all of us should start to think now about, how that's gonna work for our workplaces because we've been doing it for a couple months now uh, and, and, it, and it will be important for us to be able to articulate why or why you can't uh, work from home in, in the performance of the job. Um, for those job descriptions like the, the woman I just explained that needed to be on site, take a look at the job descriptions and, and consider listing specifically that on-site work is an, essential, is an essential job function. Because if you don't do that, um, you're gonna have some more difficulties, but if it's there in the, in the, in the job description, it'll be easier for you to defend your, your, um, 
decision. <clears throat> One of the other things that we anticipate and have uh, seen uh, and already have seen is, is the situation where employees are fearful of coming back to work. Um, <clears throat> generalized weariness of concerns does not implicate the ADA or require any accommodation of, of any kind. Um, but be careful because uh, employees may have other complicating factors um, and, and it might then trigger a mental health or even physical issue that uh, might require an accommodation. So the interactive process here is gonna be critically important uh, in, in the future for all of us. If the employee expresses a fear, um, you, you know, it's fair to say, tell me a little more about that. Um, or do you have a, a need that, that requires an accommodation? How can we help? Those kinds of things will open up that interactive process, get you to have that discussion, hopefully bring in some medical providers that can give additional information because it's always easier, as, as we know, not to play doctor, but to, let, to, to rely on the professionals and their good advice on what best to do. It, it could be the employee has an underlying physical condition or mental health that's exacerbated, who knows? Uh, but when they come to you to begin that interactive uh, process, that's th that is the first step uh, uh, to getting through the accommodation analysis and working with the doctor and getting them back to work in a in a helpful way. I think that's it for us. Bob, we have uh, a we'll question have from one of our participants okay. that I can answer. Um, this participant asked, "Is the extended family?" leave unpaid leave similar to OFLA and FEMLA and that there's some con contradictory information out there. So the extended family leave that you're talking about under the FFCRA um, really only relates to school closures and daycare closures that as a, are as a result of COVID. So it's very, very narrow. Whereas FEMLA and OFLA have now incorporated some of that um, as part of temporary rules, for example, with OLI. But really, FEMLA and OFLA are those unpaid leaves that are related to serious health conditions. So FFCRA is much, much more narrow. I think part of the conversation or part of the confusion, excuse me, that comes from that is because it's being called extended family leave, which makes us think about FMLA. Um, and so it feels like they're much more closely tethered together than they otherwise would be. But that extended family leave um, with its pay obligations and everything else that really is limited to school and daycare closures as a result of COVID. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to jump in. Hopefully we answered that one for you. Hearing none, um, if anybody else has any questions or comments for us, um, happy to take them from you offline. You've got our contact information or feel free to reach out to your normal talking lawyer. I'm always happy to help out and want to be a resource for you here during these tough and confusing times. Um, but if, unless anybody else has any questions, we will uh, wrap this up and thank you again for attending on behalf of both Bob and me and the rest of the Tonkin team. Thanks everybody. Have a good day.